Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Renzo Riemens will defend the academic thesis entitled Neuroepigenomics in Alzheimer's Disease, the Single Cell ADs Neuroepigenomics by their Alzheimer's Krankheit, the Einzelzell ADDs. May I invite you to present uh, a summary of your thesis, uh, Mr. Riemens, and the conclusion of your thesis in the next 15 minutes. I give you the word. Thank you. Dear Prorector, dear members of the Corona, dear family, friends and colleagues, welcome and thank you for being here today. In the upcoming 30 to 40 minutes, I will give you an overview of my thesis and I will present you with a summary of the research that I conducted during my PhD. So to start with a very brief introduction, our human brain can be divided in different brain structures that each have their own function. As you can see here in the slide, the region depicted in green, the locus cerealis, and the region depicted in dark yellow, the dorsal rata nucleus, are, for example, known to be involved in regulating our stress response and our emotions. If we zoom in a bit closer on these structures, you will realize that these consist of different types of brain cells. And these brain cells each fulfill an important role in the proper execution of these brain functions. So you can basically imagine this as follows. Our brain is like an organization, the different structures are like different departments within the organization, and our cells are like employees that each fulfill an important role in the department and the organization. Interestingly, is that although our cells are known to be different and function differently from another, DNA inside of these cells is exactly the same. And our DNA basically contains all the necessary information for the cell to know how to function and to know how to be different from another. And these instructions are encoded inside of our DNA sequence, which is basically a very uh, unique kind of language that you can imagine as letters such as C's, D's, A's, and G's, as also depicted here in the slide. So in theory, we could say that even though our cells are different and function differently from another, they all receive the same instructions. So then the question, of course, is how do these cells know to be different from another? Well, that is mediated by a process that we call epigenetics. And epigenetics is basically the addition of very small chemical modifications on top of our DNA that determine which of these instructions are active or inactive. And these instructions we also refer to as genes. One example of these modifications, as you can also see here in the slide, is called 5-methylcytosin, or in short, 5-MC. And this modification itself basically works like a traffic light. So as you can see, when the modification is present, the traffic lights are on red, meaning that the instruction or the gene is inactive for the cell. And when the modification is absent, the traffic lights are green, meaning that this, uh, this uh, instruction or the gene itself is active and used by the cell. So based on this brief introduction, I hope that it's now a bit clear that the chemical modifications basically determine the different cell types and the different functions that these cells have. Of course, it's therefore also very important that these modifications are placed in the right position of our D DNA and in the right genes in order for these cells to be able to function properly. So you then probably also can imagine when these modifications are misplaced or they might disappear for whatever reason that the cell might lose uh, track of its function. In the worst case, that can even lead to cell death or other substantial changes in our brain architecture. And as it's currently understood, such changes might even contribute to the development and the course of Alzheimer's disease, where adverse changes in very specific brain regions affect the functions and might even underlie the symptomatology that we observe at the clinic in the patients. In chapter two of my thesis, we summarized various kinds of studies that have associated epigenetic dysregulation with Alzheimer's disease in various regions of the Alzheimer brain. However, none of these studies has ever assessed whether epigenetic dysregulation also plays a role in key structures like the dorsal rata nucleus. 
which is known to be affected very early in the disease process of Alzheimer's disease. In fact, this regulation inside of this gene might in, even underlie changes in the mood of the patients that we already observed before uh, memory associated problems. So we were interested to assess whether epigenetic dysregulation, specifically in this brain region, also plays a role in the disease. So in chapter five of my thesis, we therefore conducted the first large scale epigenetic study in this dorsal rafa nucleus that has been performed to date. And for this purpose, and as you also can see here in the slide, dorsal rafa brain tissues were collected from both healthy, patient, healthy individuals as well as Alzheimer's disease patients. DNA was then isolated and epigenetic modifications were then analyzed using a technique that we call epigenetic array. And this epigenetic array basically allows us to look at 850,000 possible positions where modifications can be added on top of our DNA in multiple genes or multiple different instructions simultaneously. And during this initial discovery study, we then identified multiple genes or multiple uh, instructions to be dysregulated inside the dorsal rafa nucleus of these Alzheimer patients. The gene or instruction that showed the highest degree of dysregulation was then validated using a second technique that we call pyro sequencing. In the upcoming five minutes, I will show you the data that we obtained from these studies, and I will share with you my main findings and conclusions that were drawn from these studies. So on this slide, you can see the results of one of the genes that shows the biggest, highest degree of uh, dysregulation in the dorsal rafa nucleus of Alzheimer's disease. And what the graph shows you on the x-axis is the disease severity, or in other words, on the left side of the graph, you have the healthy controls, and the more we move to the right, the sicker the patient and the more severe the disease becomes. On the y-axis, we then have the amount of green traffic lights that is expressed as a percentage. So what this graph basically shows you is that for a gene or an instruction that we call Tennyson XB, that the green traffic lights increased it with increasing disease, disease uh, severity. And these findings were then confirmed by using this aforeman aforementioned second technique basically demonstrating for the first time that epigenetic dysregulation inside of this gene, inside of this dorsal rafa nucleus, plays an important role in Alzheimer's disease. So dysregulation in this gene might even underlie or play an important role in cellular dysfunction that is observed inside of this brain region very early in the disease process. There is, however, one issue with these findings. And that is the issue of cellular heterogeneity of the bulk tissues that are used from, uh, from different individuals and that are used to study uh, epigenetic dysregulation in the disease. In fact, these tissues that consist of multiple cell types are known to be able to induce noise during the anal uh, analysis of these traffic lights or modifications, and they interfere with the data interpretation. So as for, for example, as also then shown here in the slide, we know that cell death is something commonly ob observed in the brain of Alzheimer patients. And we know that cell death itself can affect the proportions of these traffic lights independent of epigenetic changes. So it might therefore happen if we take tissues from a healthy control and an Alzheimer patient, that it seems that the green traffic lights as also depicted here are more present in the brain of this Alzheimer patient. While in reality, this is not related to epigenetic changes. So red traffic lights becoming green, but simply due to the fact that we lost, lost certain kind of cell types, and in this case, more red ones than green ones. So it is very important actually to analyze epigenetic modifications in individually isolated cell types, and then to really assess whether the epigenetic dysregulation in these cells is associated with the disease. And this is actually something that has not been done very often or not at all up until to date. In the last part of chapter five, we therefore conducted another validation study where we looked at individual cell types inside of this dorsal rafa nucleus. And for this purpose, a different cohort of healthy control and patients was used. And tissues were again sampled, but in this case stained for a marker that we call serotonin. And this serotonin is only present in one very specific cell type that is found in this brain structure. We then dissected stained cells or cells that are here depicted in purple or also known as serotonin positive cells, as well as uh, non-stained cells that are depicted in gray or also known as serotonin negative cells. And then the epigenetic modifications in this TNXB gene were analyzed 
in both cell types as well as between the Alzheimer patients and controls. And then we're uh, compared between these uh, two cell types and the patients and the controls. So in this slide, you can see a graph displaying our findings of the cell-specific validation study. And on the x-axis, you have the different cell types for both Alzheimer con uh, patients and the healthy controls. The controls are in white and the Alzheimer patients are in black. On the y-axis, you then have again the amount of modifications, or in this case, the red traffic lights. And as you can see, within the serotonin positive cells or the purple cells, the level of modifications in Alzheimer patients is on average higher as compared to the healthy controls. Whereas for the serotonin negative cells or the non-stained cells, the pattern is basically opposite. The modifications are in the Alzheimer patients lower than the healthy controls. So overall, we therefore concluded that the epigenetic dysregulation inside of this gene is not as only associated with Alzheimer's disease, but also uh, dependent on the cell type that you're looking at. And these findings, and of course, have crucial implications for future studies, because it clearly demonstrates the need for doing single cell type analysis opposite to the bulk tissue analysis that are commonly performed up until to date. So now only two questions remain unanswered regarding the dysregulation inside of this gene. So the first question that remains is, is what exactly are the functional consequences of the epigenetic dysregulation on a cellular level? So we know, for example, that TNXB is involved in organizing and maintaining the structure of tissue, but it remains currently unclear how this epigenetic dysregulation that we observe affects its function inside of this brain, uh, brain structure. And of course, therefore, it also remains unclear how the dysregulation can underlie certain kind of symptomatology that we observe in the patients. It will therefore be, be very important for future studies to really try and look and find out what the consequences are of this epigenetic dysregulation inside of this gene. The second question that remains is what came first? Is it the epigenetic dysregulation or is it the Alzheimer's disease? Since which is basically the same as the story uh, of the chicken and the egg. So although we find changes in this DNXB gene, it's important to realize that we only uh, analyze these modifications at the point where the patient already passed away. So it can very easily be that the disease starts and changes occur in the brainstem region and then induce epigenetic dysregulation, but it can also be easily the other way around, that for example, the epigenetic dysregulation induces Alzheimer's disease. So one possible solution that could aid in answering these questions would be the use of stem cells that can be obtained from Alzheimer's patients and then used to study certain kinds of disease mechanisms. In chapter six and seven of my thesis, we therefore describe how stem cells can be obtained and used to study Alzheimer's disease. And as you can see in this slide from both skin tissue as well as uh, blood samples, we nowadays can isolate cells and grow these in a laboratory. And then we can transform these cells to become stem cells, or as we call them, induced pluripotent stem cells or iPSCs. And then we can further specialize these cells to become brain cells. And these brain cells then can be used to change epigenetic modifications and to study the functional consequences of these changes. But we can also use these, for example, to test drugs or medication, or even to study the effect of certain kinds of environmental exposures on the cells. In chapter eight of my thesis, we therefore established the protocol that allows us to obtain brain cells, brain cells from these iPSCs. And what you can see here on the top of the slide are images that are taken at different steps of this protocol. And what it shows you is that the stem cells clearly change their appearance and become more like brain cells. In the bottom of the slide, you can then see different kinds of stainings that we performed in order to uh, assess the functional characteristics of these obtained cells. It is, of course, very important for us to first confirm whether the cells that we produce in the laboratory are similar to cells that we can find inside of our brain. And what these stainings basically show you is that indeed the functional characteristics of these cells are similar to cells that we can find inside of our brain. We therefore concluded that the protocol that we describe in this chapter might be suitable for future studies in order to study Alzheimer's disease, for example, to study epigenetic dysregulation inside of this TNXB gene. So to conclude, during this presentation, I have shown you that epigenetic dysregulation contributes to the development and course of Alzheimer's disease, or more specifically, that dysregulation in this TNXB gene 
is associated with Alzheimer's disease and dependent on the cell type that we're looking at. In addition, I've also shown you that IPSC models might be a suitable approach in order to investigate the functional consequences of these changes on the cells. So overall, I hope I therefore convinced you that the single cell studies and IPSC models are of immense added value for neuroepigenomic studies. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I give the word back to the pro -rector. Thank you very much, Mr. Candidate, and also for your very clear and well-illustrated presentations. So it's now time that we have start some discussions with you and that we have six opponents for the audience here. And I would like to give first the word to Professor Prickhardt. He is affiliated as Professor of Experimental Neuropsychopharmacology at our university and also was the chair of your assessment committee. Thank you very much, dear Prorector. Dear candidate, first of all, I would like to congratulate you with your excellent thesis. Uh, and I also want to congratulate your promotion teams in Maastricht and in Würzburg. I have to look over there, I think. These teams consist of excellent scientists in this field of epigenetics and iPSCs. But I have to admit that I'm not a true expert in this field. And as you just heard, my chair is experimental neuropsychopharmacology. But even for scientists like me, your research is extremely important as it might identify and validate new potential drug targets. So I read it with great interest. In particular, I like your critical general discussion and your realistic and quite personal impact paragraph. Also the figure at page 359, please have a look at it, which depicts an overview of your academic career thus far, I found already very impressive. Therefore, I'm very happy that our research master program, Fundamental Neuroscience, ignited your ac academic journey in 2014. And for the people who don't know, Fundamental Neuroscience is probably the best research master program we have. Besides these nice words, I still also have some questions which I would like to ask to you. So let's go. You state several times in your thesis th that epigenetics has great potential for the development of uh, early, of either biomarker assays, or new therapies to prevent or even treat or even prevent or treat Alzheimer's disease. You also state that EWAS in blood or brain tissue does not allow to discriminate between cause or consequences of a disease. However, in your view, the use of IPSC models will allow to study cause and consequences, as just shown very nicely with the chicken egg picture. Anyway, can you still please explain me why IPSCs are better suited than to study this chicken egg cause consequences in relation to Alzheimer's disease? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your very nice words and compliments. Um, yeah, so you're asking about how IPSCs would be a suitable model to look uh, into causality. So the nice thing that we can do not nowadays is we can differentiate these cells as I showed you towards brain cells. And then in combination with other kinds of techniques, we are able to change these epigenetic modifications. By changing these epigenetic modifications, we can see what this has as a consequence on the cells based on the function. And we can even combine that with, for example, exposing these cells to certain kinds of environmental factors that we, are, that we know to be associated with disease. So if you imagine that we know, for example, that one gene is specifically involved in the disease, we can change that and assess how that changes the cells, its functions, as well as whether this might play a role, for example, in susceptibility or resilience towards certain kinds of environmental factors. The nice thing what we can do here is really play around and manipulate with these cultures. What we do generally now is profiling epigenetic um, modifications inside of brain tissue and in blood. And this is, of course, already at the end of the disease process. So we cannot really say from that whether that is the cause of the disease or whether the disease related changes occur first and that induces then the epigenetic change that we observe. Okay, but it's more technical advances if I understand correctly. So with, mm -hmm. for instance, with using CRISPR-Cas, as you nicely explained, fused to these enzymes which can stimulate or inhibit methylation, you can study cause consequences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, still I'm not that 100% convinced, but it's indeed a very nice tool which you can use. So. But that also brings me to the next question I have, and that has to do with therapies. You state several times that epigenetic uh, editing might represent a future therapeutic intervention on itself. And you mentioned that this could be explored by the use of, again, there we go, these IPSCs. 
So with great interest, I read your impact paragraph because I like valorization, of course. And there you make this rather personal statement. I'm going to quote, I strongly believe that this work will contribute in the long term to alleviating socioeconomic burden. Good, yeah, yeah, it's always good to state that. So the question actually then I have, I wanted to read further, I didn't find anything. So my question is, how do you see this? In other words, can you give a concrete example how your work could translate into a possible therapy for AD? It's a very good question. Um, of Thank course, this, this, <laughs> the statement that I'm making there is, is pretty strong. And of course, it's a bit um, early maybe to make it because the techniques that we are currently having available to study these kinds of processes and that potentially might contribute to developing ther therapies and so on, they're in a very early stage of, stage of development. So even coming back to CRISPR-Cas, we know that we can change certain kinds of epigenetic modifications and genes that we can target ourselves. But of course, this comes along with still a lot of A-specific uh, targeting and so on. So we will have to um, work on improving these techniques, of course, first to be able to do that very precisely. And of course, with reducing as much uh, as possible side effects uh, that could arise from uh, a specificity. Um, so how could this then translate into um, a technique to um, treat therapies? At the moment, um, it's a bit challenging because very often we use certain kinds of uh, viruses that um, integrate these constructs inside of our DNA. So we'll definitely will have to find alternatives that can be applied relatively easily and safely in order to change the genes that we're looking at and that we know that might play a role in causing the disease. And as soon as we have received this specificity and safety, of course, that would be then the point where we would be able maybe to change these modifications and treat yeah. the patients. Yeah. Thank you very much. You gave it good, some good thought. Indeed, if you can step away from the viruses, maybe CRISPR-Cas itself, then it could be useful. Mm -hmm. Epigenetic also is not changing the DNA itself. Ethically, I think that's probably easier to be allowed than genetic editing. Yes. Yeah, but yeah, if you need a virus, still you go to the DNA. Still, anyway, yeah. but I'm very uh, satisfied with the answer. Thank you very much. I give the word back to the ProRecord. Much. The opposition will be continued by Professor Fuster. She's affiliated as Professor in Neurobiology and Genetics. And of course, I would like to welcome her from Würzburg to join this opposition, and I would like to give her the word. Professor Fuster. Thank you very much. So first of all, I also would like to congratulate you to this excellent thesis, and especially to this very clear talk that I enjoyed a lot. I would like to start with a specific question to chapter five, especially figure two, that you also have uh, shown in your presentation. And there you show that the methylation of the tennis gene, uh, gene XB is increased or has the tendency to be increased in the serotonergic neurons, but it is decreased in other cell types. And that is actually what you found in the EVAS data of the entire dorsal rafe tissue. Okay, so my question is, first of all, was it significantly increased in the serotonergic neurons or it's just a tendency, as you said perfectly in your thesis? And the second more important question would be, can you tell me a little bit more about the cell type, the type of the other cells where the methylation is actually decreased. So highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your kind words and nice questions. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't really hear the first question, probably during due the- Oh God, the sorry. Could, could you <laughs> briefly re repeat that? Yeah, sorry. My, my first question was very simple. Is the methylation, so the increase in methylation in the serotonergic neurons significantly significant or not? I think that not, but I just want to know. So that's a very good question indeed. No, so um, indeed what we assessed here in this um, figure or what the figure basically shows you is a significant, significant effect for the interaction effect. So basically showing that the changes that we observe are indeed dependent on the disease phenotype as well as the cell type that we're looking at. We then, of course, follow up these, uh, these analysis with looking for main effects to see whether changes can be explained by only the disease phenotype and cell types. But unfortunately, we didn't find any significant findings there. Similar when comparing the groups, so the different cell types uh, or the different modifications, sorry, the 
comparing the modifications between, for example, the serotonergic neurons obtained from the Alzheimer patients and the controls, we indeed didn't find any significant findings. Yep. Yeah. And that is why you correctly stated it is a tendency, right? Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 But now to the second part of my question, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the nature of the other cells in the nasal raphe nucleus, where I think there was indeed a significant decrease in methylation? Yeah, so that's correct what you're saying. So we're observing indeed a significant decrease, or at least the, the comparison there didn't... Um, so if we compared the non serotonergic cells between the Alzheimer patient and the cold we didn't see a negative of, or a significant negative effect. But of course, the pattern that we observed there is similar to what we see in the EWAS study that was performed on bulk tissues. Um, relating to the cell types that we can find in this brain region, so the data that you see here, relates to different kinds of cell types that you can find next to the serotonergic neurons inside of this brain structure. And these can include, for example, glia cells, or even interneurons, GABAergic interneurons, uh, or even other kinds of um, neurons, such as dopaminergic neurons, and so on, that might be present or innervate this brain structure coming from other brain regions. So it basically suggests indeed that the signal that we obtain in the EWAS probably relates to these other cell types that we can find in this brain structure. Mm -hmm. And can you speculate a little bit about the putative function of these other cell types, for example, glia cells? So what, uh, what, may, what function may we have in the etiology of sporadic Alzheimer's disease? Um, so the, the glia cells, of course, are sort of our immune cells from the brain. And what we know is that Alzheimer's disease comes along with a lot of depositions of proteins that are inducing inflammation. And then glia cells, specifically microglia, uh, to be more specific, um, these are known to be involved in, in, in mediating this inflammatory response, which is then, of course, also damaging and so on for the, the cells that are also residing in this uh, brain region. If you're referring to um, also how TNXB or the changes within this different cell types um, could be explained, that is still a matter of debate and it's something that we still need to um, further uh, investigate in order to understand better the functions of this gene in different cell types and of course what the epigenetic changes, what the consequences are uh, for this gene as well as the functions of these cells. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And actually also in the locus ceruleus, you found a similar hypomethylation of the tenosine XB gene. Do you think or do you know whether this is also true to the non-adrenergic no cells? So not for the neurons, but perhaps also for the yeah, glia cells. So that's also a very good question. Um, now, we didn't look into cell-specific effects in this brain structure, but of course we know that serotonergic neurons are very specific for the dorsal raven. So since the effect in the bulk tissues overlap in broad, both brainstem region, it actually also sort of extra uh, emphasizes or confirms that the effect that we observe are probably not related to the serotonergic neurons, but other types of neurons that we can find or other types of cells that we can find inside of this locus cerealis. So to answer the question in short, so no, we didn't look into cell-specific effects, but it sort of enhances the findings that we observed, of course, in those around. Okay, so thank you very much. So I would like to give uh, back to um, Dr. Sorry. To the pro-rector. Thank you very much. Okay, I understand the question. Very good. The opposition will be then continued by uh, Professor Lukasen. He was also a member of your assessment committee and he is affiliated as professor in brain plasticity at the University of Amsterdam. And of course, on behalf of Maastricht University, I also would like to thank him that he likes to join this morning. And I'd like to give him the word, Professor Lukassen. Yes, thanks, Mr. Pro Rector. And dear candidate, can you hear me well? Hello? Hello? Yes? You hear me well? Yes, yes, we hear you well. <laughs> okay, good. For future of my right, it's my privilege to discuss with you uh, your beautiful thesis. And um, I would first like to congratulate you and your team uh, with this extensive and I think very long uh, piece of work on the epigenome and iPSCs in Alzheimer's. I've really liked, uh, I really liked reading it. It's a very extensive work um, and also both the combination of the cell-specific uh, epigenetic profiling that you did, the laser capturing, 
the techniques using this uh, B-sulfide pyrosequencing combined with a very nice set of reviews that at least for me provided really a bird's eye view of the field. I think it was really a display of a combination of on the one hand technical detail and in-depth knowledge combined with really a, a very big perspective that you can have. That's very um, impressive. Um, my question actually uh, relates to the chapters six, seven, and eight. And I, can, I think we can discuss it more in general aspects uh, because you mentioned uh, several times in your thesis that the use of IPSCs, and also it was dis discussed a bit with the first opponent, could be seen as a model to, let's say, uh, imitate or replicate uh, aspects of particular the sporadic forms of Alzheimer's disease. And some people have gone, of course, a couple of steps further and developed also mini brains and organoids um, out of these, uh, these cells. So there's a great potential uh, to do that. Take, take existing cells from a patient and de-differentiate them to a stem cell stage. But while doing so, on the one hand, you eradicate and, and strip uh, a lot of the DNA of its epigenetic tags. Um, so to some extent, you can wonder whether that it still relates to the original uh, disease condition. But I guess if we take it a little bit broader, this perspective, what it, there, there, there are several criteria for a good model, right? You, you can have these models also for animals and, and uh, you should know the construct. It should look a bit like the disease. Um, but you also indicate that every model is different for every patient. Um, there are a lot of different aspects of how uh, an IPC cells grow. They, they form uh, networks in a different order than it has happened in the brain of, of a patient. Sometimes in an inside out manner, um, they have no blood vessels. Uh, there is no immune system present in, the, in those dishes uh, with these cells. And also the link with the glia, which was discussed just before, is very different because these are just neurons and they don't have often glia on board or there are different proportions of glia. It's only a subset of glia that is inserted. So for me, uh, I would like to hear from you um, how, on the one hand, reliable you think these IPCs are if you want to actually test drugs. And maybe from there, could you also take a step back and, and, and maybe think about some criteria uh, that you would like to see present in such cellular models? Uh, and once they are there, you can say, okay, now I really want to test my drug because now I think it's really a, a proper model. I would like to hear your ideas about that uh, first. So highly esteemed opponent, so thank you for your nice words and the uh, nice questions you are asking. Um, Yes, so variability is indeed something that we observe quite a lot in these um, models at the moment. And of course, there is still a big uh, part of research now diving into characterizing these models and assessing to see what kind of variability we really observe, whether this is, for example, related or similar to variability that we observe in patients, whether such thing can be related to more technical aspects of conducting these protocols and obtaining these uh, brain cells. Um, so yes, reliability, how to assess that? Well, it really depends, of course, on, on your research question. So personally, myself, I'm very interested to see, indeed, like I already mentioned before, whether epigenetics uh, uh, play a role in Alzheimer's disease. So our aim now is to, for example, validate or to assess whether epigenetic changes that we observe in the brain of a patient are also recapitulated uh, inside of these brain cells. Um, mm -hmm. If you, of course, would like to study epigenetic dysregulation in this respect, in order to have a valid model, um, of course, these changes would need to be present in order to be able to study that. Or you would need to be able to maybe manipulate the culture in such a way that you can still provoke the expression of these uh, factors in order to be able to see what their relation is uh, with the disease. Um, so yeah, in light of criteria, yeah, it's, it's like I said, it, it really depends on, on what you're looking at. So if, if you're interested, of course, in, in, in cell cell interactions and you really would like to study what the effect is uh, of certain kinds of changes in one cell type and how that affects the other cell type, of mm -hmm. course, an important criteria would be then, of course, to have both cell types present. And what we now, of course, also see is that indeed differentiation of these cells sometimes uh, induce heterogeneous uh, populations that have certain cell types present, but also other cell types for example, right. not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just a, well, I mean, 
And this is the same, of course, with, with having the epigenetic modifications present. At, at the point that you can really detect that the cells that you're producing inside of the laboratory are similar to what we observe in the brain, I guess that's, that's a good criteria to be able to, be, to work with them, basically. Right. But, but maybe we can go back to, to uh, recent uh, history, because there is a drug available for Alzheimer's that was uh, launched this, this summer. Uh, probably you've heard about that, the Aducatumab story and the, the, uh, well, the debate about the role of the FDA, etc. This is a drug that is um, being uh, developed and it's being tested and it shows some promise in terms of reduction of amyloid levels, but that's, there are several clinical data about it that it doesn't work or it does work, but this would be an ideal candidate for me uh, to test in your uh, model systems. But what should be in that model system uh, to see whether it is an effective drug? Would you, because if you see effects on the neurons, you would probably see changes in, in amyloid, but the side effects might come uh, from the glia. So uh, would you test this aducadumab on your in vitro preparations? And what would be the best what setting be for, the that best best for that preparation? Well, it's, it's a good question. Of course, I mean, if you assume that the drugs plays a role in, in reducing the plaques, you want to have the plaques present, expose the cells to yeah. the drugs, and then see indeed whether the plaques reduces. I mean, then, then of course, you can demonstrate that at least what you're hypothesizing about this drug is visible in the in vitro cultures. But how does then uh, affect other cells? Well, if, if, you, if you observe these things in neurons and you would like to study also glia, I mean, then the glia also have to be, have to be present in, inside of the culture. We even would yeah. like to translate that, of course, to behavior. And that gets a, bit, a little bit difficult, of course, in, in, in vitro cultures. So that you have to, of course, step away from that and move to animal models or anything in that respect. Yeah. Yeah. In relation to that, the next really, question would yeah. be that if you are going to do that, and you want to expand these cultures a bit more, uh, the field knows that once they start to grow, at some point, the core of this group of cells starts to become necrotic because there's no blood vessels and there's no uh, sufficient oxygen. So one solution for that, and that's what is you, what you discuss, you can take this organoid, this growing ball of cells, and then inject it in a live animal. And then you're talking about the chimeric genograft model, and then these cells work and they survive and they follow the blood vessels and they really integrate into the mouse brain. And if that is patient material, that's an interesting discussion. I, I was at a meeting last uh, year and there was one big person in the room and he said, okay, I'm looking at these patient derived cells that are grown in culture and then placed in a live mouse brain. Does this mouse now think like I do or is it still thinking like a mouse? So do you see possibilities to do this in a real, um, let's say, large uh, setting? Uh, aren't there any ethical issues involved if you want to test it this way? Or how, what's your view on that? Well, that's, that's, that's a, an interesting uh, statement, yes. Um, ethically, of course, there's always uh, ethics involved, especially when working with animals. So as soon, of course, when you want to introduce these uh, organoids inside of an animal, you will need to have approval, first of all, of course, from the committees to be able to, to work with it. Um, whether the mouse would think different or will be different, probably yes. Um, of course, you're going to manipulate something inside of their brain. So you're going to add cells that are not present there. So it's going to have an effect, of course, on the microenvironment at the site of injection. Uh, mm -hmm. Depending on what brain, brain structure you might induce these cells, of course, that can, can come along with side effects or change how these cells uh, naturally work uh, without mm -hmm. having the organoids present. So yes, definitely. I think that, of course, is something that could happen and we definitely would need to yeah, assess what the consequences are of, of just simply adding human cells inside of a mice or red brain. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think uh, also in view of time, I would like to thank you uh, for excellent answers and I give the word back to the, to the project. Thanks. Thank you very much. The opera session will be continued by Dr. Schmidt. He's involved as, uh, as uh, in the Department of Functional Neuroanatomy at the University of Würzburg. He was also a member of your assessment committee. And I also would like to thank him that he joins our discussion here in Maastricht. I'd like to give him the words. Dr. Schmidt. Okay. Renzo, do you, do you hear me? <clears throat> First of all, I yes. would like to congratulate uh, to your really uh, impressive thesis and this very clear presentation uh, today. My questions are more related to chapter two because um, I found it very interesting, this establishment, this different approach 
uh, using this spike in DNA pyrosequencing method. Um, first of all, I would like, because I'm very interested in, about the differences be between methyl cytosine and hydroxy methyl cytosine, can you please give me an overview about the different functions of these tools? So there's the opponent. Uh, thank you for your compliments and uh, for your question. Um, yes, so what we do know about the differences in methylation and hydroxymethylation is that historically uh, methylation uh, inside of promoter regions of genes is known to be associated with transcriptional repression. So when methylation is present in a promoter, a gene is historically, because of course studies have shown already different, uh, not expressed. So there seems to be very uh, a clear association between methylation and the effect on gene expression. While for hydroxymethylation, this is a bit more um, possible to go in both directions. So that's not as clear as, as it is, for example, with uh, five methyl cytosine. So the presence of this hydroxy methyl group on top of our DNA can both be involved in, in increasing expression, downregulating expression, and both of these modifications themselves also placed in, for example, gene body uh, uh, in the gene body or close to introns and exons can also be involved in regulating splicing, uh, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay, many thanks for that answer. That's why I think the, to look uh, at these two things in a different, or to separately look at, at, at these two cytosines is a very important issue. And I'm happy that you tried to deal with that and establish this spike in DNA private sequencing method together with your colleagues, of course. One of the next question is whether there are some indications you in, your, in chapter two, you mentioned that hydroxymethylcytosine is is uh, the occurrence of it is higher in the brain than in other uh, body tissue. Why do you think, uh, do you have any idea about the reason for that? And the next question is whether there are some indications whether this increased occurrence in, is different in the course of evolution regarding different species? That's a very good question. Um, the reason why I think that 5-HMC is higher in the brain uh, is simply related to the fact that our brain as an organ is a very dynamic organ. There's a lot of changes occurring and a lot of processes um, need a lot of changes at the level of gene expression, memory, for example, but also a lot of other changes. Um, so there is a high demand inside of this organ in order to uh, change the modifications and regulate gene expression. The hydroxymethylcytosine itself um, is, is a product basically of oxidizing the 5 methyl cytosine. And uh, although it's known as a stable mark, of course, it's also part of the demethylation process. So by removing the methyl marks and so on from the DNA. So given this dynamic nature of this organ and the need to change the gene expression in a lot of various situations, I think that um, um, the change that we observe there might underlie or explain why uh, inside of this organ we see a lot um, of a higher degree of 5-HMC, mc sorry. Mm -hmm. And what's about the different mm -hmm. species? So could you, could you elaborate, sorry, on, on, on how do you mean the different species? So I'm, I'm personally, I'm not aware about differences between uh, species. Yes, okay, that would, then you answered already my question. Uh, my question was whether there are some differences regarding these higher levels in the brain and regarding hydroxymethylcytosine, whether there are some difference be between different species. And the next, of course, I'm quite sure that we'll, we'll say yes. Uh, the question is whether there are some differences during development, of course. The development between different species or development, oh, development in one species, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so the question then is whether there are differences observed in 5-hydroxymethylcytosine that we see uh, in the adult brain that are retraceable back to developmental processes. Do mm -hmm. I understand that correctly? Mm -hmm. Oof, that's very spe specific. Um, <laughs> 
To be honest with you, I, I wouldn't actually really know. I can imagine, of course, that during the development, there's a lot of changes occurring and um, certain kinds of diseases, of course, also developmentally related and might have an un underpinning in the epigenetic processes. So when these things occur uh, during development, um, you might consequently observe differences in the adult brain that are already caused during this process because of diseases or other kinds of um, processes in that respect. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Um, more general question is related to the tissue you used for in your investigations. The tissue comes from human individuals and they, the, they had a completely, I suppose, different uh, postmortal delay, for example, and they had a different way of dying. Did you, um, yeah, how did you overcome the problems uh, resulting from these different uh, things, different postmortem delay and different types of dying. Did you yeah, deal with that? So, so yeah, we, we know indeed that postmortem, the postmortem interval is, is a very important factor that can uh, influence uh, both transcript, transcriptomic as well as epigenetic uh, modifications. In that respect, epigenetic modifications are more stable though. Um, but what we did in order to counteract that is we made sure that the groups that we analyzed are matched in relation to the postmortem interval. So that the time basically uh, between the comparisons, uh, or at least the time uh, of, of uh, uh, um, obtaining the brains from the patients between the two comparisons that we're making, the different groups, Alzheimer's and controls, um, that this is corrected so that we know that we're looking at yeah, the brains that have went through the same time, basically. And that's how we try to deal with that. I mean, you, you, you do that, of course, to check uh, or, or to make sure that um, the material that you're looking at has uh, underwent, uh, went through basically the same kind of um, procedure in order to um, exclude effects that can be explained by, for example, post-mortem interval. Mm -hmm. Okay, so but that's how, yeah. I think that's all from my side. Many thanks for your uh, good answers and I will give back to the pro-rector. Thank you very much. Then the opposition will be continued by Dr. Van Mierlo. He is affiliated with uh, the Department of Psychiatry and Neuropsychology and I like from Maastricht University, of course, and I like to give him the word. Uh, thank you, Mr. Um, first of all, I would like uh, to congratulate the PhD candidate, uh, his promoters and co-promoters, both in, uh, in the Netherlands and in Germany, with this well-written thesis, uh, which was uh, technically advanced and reflects a high scientific uh, standard. So the candidate clearly masters the state-of-the-art in neuroepigenetics and in central nervous system stem cell biology. Moreover, the candidate performs an impressive investment in optimizing important techniques, setting up workflows and expanding toolboxes in the field. Investing time and effort in these building blocks of science uh, is, is really extremely important and uh, sometimes covered too much by result-driven research. So hence I was uh, very pleased to see that you integrated both the generation of these building blocks and applying them into a, a research topic. Um, moreover, um, while reading through, through your thesis, uh, uh, I, I noticed that you uh, had a bright insight into uh, the, the topics addressed, and uh, it triggered me to uh, propose some questions uh, to discuss with you and to uh, get, get your ideas uh, on this. And the first topic I'd like to discuss with you is actually on, uh, related to chapter four. It's on targeted methylation profiling on single laser capture microdissected post-mortem brain cells by adapted limiting dilution by sulfate biosequencing. And actually, in this chapter, you found that there was a 5.11% uh, allele retrieval. And um, I recalculated the, the number was correct. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> But uh, I was kind of, um, it triggered me the question, like, if you only retrieve 5.11% of the alleles which you, uh, of what you have uh, analyzed, and uh, actually you entered 300 alleles into the analysis, 150 cells per patient or per person. Uh, and if you calculate this 5%, it means 15 alleles. Mm -hmm. So seven to eight neurons, which uh, are entering your analysis. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of doubting, what is the advantage of looking at six to seven cells of one patient compared to the fact if you would analyze one, uh, an homogenate of 150 cells? What is more, most reliable? And I wasn't convinced that the, the new limited uh, dilution technique would be uh, an added value. Can you convince me that this is uh, an added value? 
So there's the opponent. Yeah, thank you for your nice words also and, and, and for your question. So can I convince you whether limiting dilution would be better than to look at homogenates? So, um, so to relate first to the efficiency. So and in, indeed, 5% is, is not much. Um, um, of course, we're looking at a very um, small part of, of all the alleles that could be retrieved. Of course, it's related to a lot of technical factors. Uh, first of all, we need to dissect the, the, the brain tissue, uh, uh, sorry, the brain tissue, make sections from it, apply staining uh, with laser uh, and heat, you then try to dissect cells. And that all, of course, affects the uh, ultimate retrieval from the amount of DNA molecules. Um, theoretically, if you would have done that, um, um, at this point, so I assume that you still refer to them doing homogenate of the same cell type. So you would still go, we need to go through the same uh, same process. Exactly, yeah, we would still yeah. go into the laser uh, capture cells. Laser capture microsection, yeah, yeah. So so then, of course, at, at this point, uh, what we then do is we uh, isolate the DNA, we uh, basically dilute it over different kinds of wells, so that in every well we capture basically one molecule and then run the prior sequencing on it in order to analyze methylation. Um, given that the fact that, um, um, doing a homogenate, excluding the dilution, also needs substantial manipulation of the tissue, basically in, 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 an, in a big degree similar to doing the uh, limiting dilution. I am quite convinced that the overall recovery of the DNA that we obtain from homogenate is fairly simple, uh, similar to the limiting dilution. Of course, uh, afterwards, we cannot assess that because we, we cannot count the alleles in that respect. So I would not think that the, uh, the differences between both um, are, are very substantial. Why would want someone then still, um, or, or at least as this does not convince you, um, why would then someone still want to do limiting dilution over homogenates? Well, the nice thing, of course, with limiting dilution is that we can really look on single alleles. So um, you could really assess whether changes in the brain are observed, uh, that, that are observed are related to the fact that complete alleles might change their methylation profile or whether the changes that we are observing are more CPG specific. Of course, limiting dilution itself really, really give you, gives you the resolution to look at single CPG sites at single alleles. And therefore, you might, for example, see that not complete alleles might change their methylation, but that single CPG site within the alleles that you're analyzing, um, that, that this is uh, really underlying the effect. Such things you would not be able to see in homogenates because there, of course, directly you get the average of the entire allele. You might still see fluctuations between uh, individual CPG, CPG sites uh, at the level of percentage of modifications. Um, but of course, this does not tell you whether that's related to single alleles changing their methylation completely or whether it's alleles that randomly have yeah, different uh, modifications on the CPG inside of the alleles. So if I, I might summarize it, uh... It is technically very interesting and also scientifically um, providing additional insights and in how methylation might happen. But if I would rephrase it, uh, would you apply it? Because it's quite costly and time and, uh, consuming technique to do the limiting dilution. Would you apply it when uh, you would have to answer a scientific question uh, on, on methylation of a certain uh, target? Um, I think that really depends. Maybe if you are interested in a very specific CPG site or, or a region inside of the allele in relation to transcription factor binding sites that you would really like to see whether this, this methyl group itself changes a lot. Looking back to my own research that I performed, I don't think that it would be way more important to look at single alleles as compared to, the, to doing the homogenate. In reality, uh, of course, even we now um, limiting dilution, but in the end, sort of worked up back to the average of the alleles and then compared it between different cells. So that depends a bit on the research question. For myself, I think looking back, it would not be needed. But we started with doing that, of course, and then while doing, we learned uh, yeah, how to, to improve that or whether it would really be um, of, of extreme added value, which was then also followed up by doing this homogenates and then, you know, so. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a small additional question or uh, no? Okay, then uh, thank you. I'm satisfied with the answer and uh, I'll give back the word to the project. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but that's maybe for later. No we still have one more, once one more opponent. And I would also like to give her the full attention. So I would like to introduce Dr. Schiele. She's affiliated with the Department of Experimental Psychiatry and Psychotherapy from the University Klinikum in Freiburg. And I would like to also express our gratitude that she likes to join this morning and I'd like to give her the word. Dr. Schiele. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, also from my side, I would like to congratulate you on a very impressive 
elegant and very well-rounded thesis and a very clear presentation uh, and discussion of your results. As a clinician scientist, I would like to ask you about the translational potential of your epigenetic findings to the clinic at hopefully some point in the, in the near or far future. Because from a clinical point of view, there's a tremendous need for and interested in uh, biomarkers that could very early on detect risk status, ideally even before symptom onset in order to inform preventive measures even. And you were able to access post-mortem tissue to investigate epigenetic markers directly in brain tissue. And you've already discussed the cell type and tissue specificity of epigenetic marks. But in living human patients, such biomarkers would be limited to peripheral tissue. And um, which tissue would you say carries the most promise for that? And could you comment on the challenges that would arise from that and how to meet them? That is, for instance, how do epigenetic readouts derive from peripheral tissue compared to that in uh, brain tissue? Opponents. So thank you, of course, also for your compliments and the nice questions that you're asking. Um, so how could the research that I'm doing translate to the clinics? Um, of course, first, I would like to stress that what I'm doing is very fundamental in nature. Um, so before being able to move to the clinics or to, to even develop uh, therapies out of the genes that I um, um, describe inside of my thesis, there would be a lot of other kinds of um, functional studies we would first need to perform to better understand what the consequences inside uh, are inside of the, the brain. Um, thinking about diagnostic uh, approaches um, and epigenetics, what we actually have done, even within our group, we have uh, done comparisons uh, where we checked longitudinally uh, whether patients in their blood, uh, for example, change epigenetic modifications or in certain kinds of genes, and whether this overlaps with, for example, uh, changes that we um, observe also in, inside of the brain. One of these genes that came out of these studies is oxytocin. Um, and what we actually there observed is that the, the earlier you are in the disease process, the bigger there the, the change is in this gene inside of the, the blood. So in that respect, um, having such a um, marker present inside of the blood that basically can predict um, whether a person would develop Alzheimer's disease uh, would be something valuable that can be used um, um, in order to assess that in a very early stage of the of the disease or even hopefully before the disease starts uh, developing. Um, how does then of course and relate to the to the brain? Um, that is something that we need to further investigate. Of course we observed also there uh, similar effects occurring in the brain. Um, but the function of this gene or the protein that comes from it might have uh, yeah, very different um, uh, effects depending on the tissues that you're looking at. So from a functional uh, aspect, we need to dive further into that by using, for example, IPSC models, manipulate the, the gene and, and see how that affects the cells. Um, but for the diagnostic purpose, I, I would say that, that yeah, doing these kinds of analysis longitudinally, so really following our patients over time and see how the methylome changes in their blood uh, might potentially be a, a valuable approach to to come up with such biomarker assays. Yeah. Excellent answer. Um, yeah, okay, thank you. And maybe a brief follow-up <laughs> question. Uh, could you speculate on a mechanism that translates between central and peripheral uh, methylation or, or epigenetic markers? That is, how do epigenetics produce change that we can measure in the periphery? Because you have leukocytes that uh, live for, for seven days and then are renewed. How uh, could it be possible that the epigenetic signatures can be measured in the blood continuously? The, the question I think that is important to ask is whether these changes that we observe are always related to each other. I don't think it is um, um, the only way that this can could occur, that you have, for example, changes occurring in the blood and that might change epigenetic changes in, in uh, or sorry, in the brain and it might change things in the blood or the other way around. I mean, these things can also very easily occur independent from each other, might be very organ or tissue or cell specific. Um, how can then still, for example, changes occur uh, in the brain and then translate into the blood? And it probably has to relate to um, the functional consequences that the change has 
um, in expression of protein and changing certain kinds of excretion of other factors, hormones, neurotransmitters, and so on, and how this impacts on other cells uh, that are residing there and, and how this changes their profiles and excretion of other factors that eventually end up in the blood. And then there, for example, might then induce um, changes again that we can then extend, uh, observe in, in, in blood cells in that respect, just as an example. Yeah. Thank you very much. That would be it from, from my side, and I would like to return the word to the prorector. Thank you very much. And I can tell you that the, the beetle is on his way because he will be here in any second. And by that, we will have you a, a short brief. I'm not going to ask an additional question because that would take uh, too much time. Thank you very much, Dr. Schiele. And I think we have now a brief seconds before the beetle will enter this room. <laughs> there she is. Mr. Renzo Riemens, the time appointed for defending your thesis has now passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss not so much the quality of your thesis, because that has already been approved by the assessment committee, but in particular, the way you have defended your thesis this morning. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberation and our return to this room. Thank you.
Mr. Renzo Riemens, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and in particular the way you have defended your thesis this morning. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree the committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor van den Hove is authorized to confer upon you this, this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university customs. And that's why I'm going to invite your supervisor now to take the floor. Uh, Renzo, dear candidate, do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times to be careful and honest, transparent, independent and responsible? Yes, I promise. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confirm you, Renzo Young, Maria Riemens, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee, and affixed with the official seal of the university. If somebody wants to make a picture, it's not the time to make a picture. <laughs> no? Okay. So, dear Dr. Riemens, this is not the only certificate that you received today. I here have a second certification. This one is the PhD certificate from the School of Mental Health and Neuroscience. And this is awarded upon you because you have followed up upon all the criteria for men's certificate and you received all ECTS points that are attached to this. So congratulations also for this diploma. And Dr. Riemens, there is one more. <laughs> So I'm uh, pleased to honor you with this uh, Euron P, uh, PhD Certificate of Excellence, uh, which is uh, uh, provided by the European Graduate School of Neuroscience, uh, because you have fulfilled all the criteria, meaning that you work in an international setting, you have followed the Euron PhD program, and you also have reached a high level of uh, scientific publication. And this uh, certificate is recognized by the seven universities, European universities of the Euron network. So congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> no more. <laughs> so dear Renzo, uh, congratulations. And before I give uh, the word to your first uh, supervisor, I would like to take the opportunity to uh, yeah, tell a few words, um, a few words about you, which is a contradiction because a man that writes a thesis of 400 pages cannot be called a man of few words. Um, special thanks to the reading committee, by the way, for doing that. Um, yes, so you have used a lot of words, but it was also needed because you did a lot of work and no matter how many words that you used, it could never capture the vast amount of work that you did in the lab. And you were very technical, um, uh, you did very technical experiments, you were very uh, creative in finding solutions, ingenious solutions to sometimes complicated technical problems, um, which you had to explain to me and Daniel also using many words. And um, be beyond all those technical things that you did, uh, you also work in different labs uh, in, in, in Europe, I think in, in four different uh, countries that, that you work. Um, you gained a lot of expertise, a lot of uh, experience. You also shared that with your uh, colleagues um, and they are very grateful uh, to you for that. 
um, also as, as the entire lab uh, will be, be gained from your expertise. Um, on the other hand, you still used many words yourself to acknowledge all the people that helped you, but I think they're uh, even more grateful. You're also a great project leader because you, you took your awesome responsibility for your own projects, but you also yeah, did a lot of other things. Uh, you, you were representative even in, in, in scientific uh, meetings of, of uh, big consortia. You also were vital in setting up our IPSC facility. You submitted grant from that project. So I am a man of few words usually, but to describe you, I can come up with words like, uh, it's admirable what you did and outstanding and exceptional and extraordinary and remarkable. And, and why remarkable? Because you all do this in the most unpretentious way. You always humble and, and modest. And so when it comes to your achievements, you are not a man of many words. And I think that also is a sign of a great scientist. You know, Frederick Sanger, who is the Nobel Prize winner, twice Nobel Prize winner. He was the grandfather of the technology that you use and the Sanger sequence and so on. And uh, um, he was a Nobel Prize winner, but he always said, well, I'm just a chap doing lab work. And I think great minds <laughs> think alike. So um, or I think how you think is um, you use many words to describe what you do and how you did it. You use many words to describe or, or to acknowledge the people that helped you, but you just need a few words to say that you are actually the mastermind behind it. So I think that's a very a strong quality um, uh, that, that should be valued. So keep up the good work and I hope we can uh, continue working together. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, I, of course, cannot agree more, uh, but I've added a few words here on, on paper, uh, Renzo, or oh, Remco, Renzo, what, what is this? Um, well, you're a postdoc now, congratulations. Um, hopefully it was an epic adventure for you. You lived in Barcelona, in Würzburg, in Maastricht. You forced bridges also with Hustle. You met the love of your life um, and, and moved in together. Uh, you actually, at a certain moment, sort of took a role as a work package leader in a big European consortium. Not too bad, not too bad, Renzo. Now, maybe we briefly go back to where this all started. I'll skip the Hulls part, because in Master we say whatever happens in Hulls stays in Hulls, except for Renzo, fortunately, he left Hulls. But um, um, it started with this bachelor internship at our university. Uh, I think also the, under the guidance of, of Esson. And that's the first time we really got acquainted. And you were this, indeed, as Gunther said, this, this sort of quiet guy, calm, a bit shy, uh, joining a lab, and you soon wanted to join our research master fundamental neuroscience. Um, I also remember you were a bit shy and nervous during that interview, but eventually you were admitted that was no problem. Yeah, and what happened then is history. Uh, with your partner in crime there, Dean, um, you made that event cohort, cohort one of the most pleasant in, in history. And you developed from this young, shy student into this person that um, that uh, kept on moving, kept on growing, and seemed to exceed the potential that people maybe initially attributed to you earlier down the line. And as a result, you became the first EPAD, or the real first EPAD PhD student. And that was the journey. You established new techniques, as Gunther said, on different domains. You presented posters. You gave talks at international meetings. You have been involved in teaching, and you got even alcoholic rewards for doing so. What a job. And that's not just a job for you, I, I would say. It's more than that. You have developed several seemingly uh, everlasting eternal friendships with fellow students and colleagues uh, down the line. And this is one of the most important criteria to become a member of the neuroepigenetics group, I would say. So next to being talent, talented scientifically, you simply have to be nice, if not very nice. And that's what you are, Enzo. You are extremely nice. Uh, and Hansa will address your parents for uh, a short while. Uh, as part of the credits related to this, of course, go to them. So you cannot just be very proud today of what your son did here and what he did over the past few years, um, resulting in this way to have a booklet 
I mean, I, I think you can actually cause nerve injury or, or brain injury with this, which is sort of opposite to what you intended uh, by, by writing it. But anyway, your son is one of the nicest persons on this planet um, in many ways. And your efforts during childhood and uh, raising him must have programmed him epigenetically in the best way possible, I would say. And that deserves a standing ovation, which you will get in a bit. Um, first, some more grilling uh, to do. Um, we'll only need one more minute. Um, Hanzo, I hope your girlfriend uh, feels a bit the same way about what I'm going to say now, but I believe this kindness of you um, is partially related to the fact that you are simply an excellent listener, um, which is vital in many ways, not just in terms of your girlfriend, but also uh, in terms of dealing with your daily supervisors. Because more than once, busy as Gunther and me are, we use our weekly meetings with you to catch up on I don't know what, to be honest. Um, but it often ended in endless brainstorms, leading absolutely nowhere, but still having fun. All in all, Renzo, you showed how to combine business with pleasure, as they say. And your scientific achievements are right in front of your face. Um, to wrap things up, what about the future right now? I have no doubts that you will do extremely well as a postdoc as you simply haven't operating at that level already for a few years, to be honest. I believe academia is a better place with you in it. So you've got the required scientific and educational skills. You've got the passion, the dedication. You've got a dean partnering up and flipping burner, burgers with uh, Leonardo soon. Um, you've got a Philippos that actually is submitting your grants in the meantime and providing you with sufficient amounts, or should I say numbers of serotonin uh, oxytocin as well. And in fact, you've got all what it's needed to, to make it. I will hope you'll continue to have fun. And I hope we can have fun along with you. Congratulations. Dear Dr. Riemens, I think it feels nice. Mm -hmm. Your body language is pretty clear about this. I would like to also congratulate you on behalf of the Board of Deans of our university and my congratulations, of course, I start with your promotion team, your big promotion teams, I should say, is basically both here in the Maastricht as well as in Würzburg. I look to my colleagues on the screen. Uh, in my congratulations, I also would like to mention your family. I guess the girlfriend is over there. I'm pretty, pretty sure about this, yes. So I also say uh, my congratulations. I also would like to uh, mention and memorate uh, a little word from Jos, who, who, Jos Prikas, who just mentioned me, my colleague. This is the first time that I, we have a, a full corona here with all my PhD students. So all of you are PhD students of mine. This uh, never happens before. That's also a nice thing to mention. And that shows you that our program is fully sustainable because I hear a lot about serotonin and about brainstem and I was pleased about this. Saying this, I think we're going to conclude. And for the conclusion, and to finalize this, uh, this, uh, this ceremony, I use officially my hammer. I close the ceremony, and we will proceed now as follows. Um, there will be a reception in the rafter, and the audience are already allowed to go to the reception and take some coffee, pie, whatever there is. We will stay here, also the family.